Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to uh, to talk, and hopefully there'll be some clinically useful information that we'll provide uh, provide you. So my disclosures, mostly funding of uh, grant funding for NIH. There are some consulting work for some small companies. Uh, I've done been on the scientific advisory board. So one of the questions I want to think about today is, you know, what is what is Moon? It's a multi-center group, and at ACL reconstruction. What are the factors that determine a worse or poor result at 10 years on your patient-reported outcomes or IKC to CUS? Is it grade three or four articular cartilage? Is it female gender? Is it meniscus tears in treatment, graft choice, or laxity? And I want to define what we mean by high-grade laxity. I'll show you that's important when I look at failure. And then I want to give you a, uh, a algorithm, or more likely a, a, a risk calculator. So how do you determine which graft, hamstring or patella tendon, is least likely to fail? How do you choose to buy a patient? And what about predicting the contralateral ACL failure? And then how do you take tools um, that we can develop in an academic world and, and bring them into the real world so it can help you make decisions in real time? So we've been very blessed in Moon. We've been funded, uh, it's been, we've been going on for 20 years. We've been funded by four different NIH grants and that's given us unprecedented uh, money to follow a group of 3,500 patients now 10 years out. The sites of Moon are here. This original network has stayed intact. Uh, believe it or not, in 20 years, no one has left. I guess that's a good sign. And these are the people at the sites behind the scenes that really do all the work, the research coordinators, and that's what's funded by the NIH. Um, what, one of the important things that, that we did, thanks to Freddie Fu and, and, and some individuals that were concerned about graft placement um, and tunnel placement, is we looked at our, our intra between surgeon and within surgeon and by technique in cadavers, on 72 cadavers with uh, 12 surgeons. We also, eight surgeons looked at them and we show our tunnels are reproducible. And that's really important because the time frame of doing our, of these surgeries was 2002 to 2008. And uh, two of us were rear incision uh, outside in guys, uh, which means that our tunnel placement on the femoral side, it's hard to get to the anterior. But we've shown our, our tunnels are very reproducible. So. I think that uh, at, least the, at least the group here that are fellowship trained have been putting tunnels in a reasonable place for time. So I think the results still hold up today. So the first study I wanna look at it, we published in 2018. It's half the cohort, it's 1,592 ACLs. And we've been able to maintain over 80% follow-up by patient reported outcomes at two, six and 10 years. And it's a multivariate analysis looking at a bunch of risk factors to say, given all the breadth of injuries, the different size, weights, sports, what matters in the end. And so one of the things we found, which was very striking looking at the different coup scales, is whatever result you got at two years, the population maintained at six years and maintained at 10 years. And that was pretty striking. I would have thought for sure the, the outcomes would get worse over 10 years, but in the population, they do not. And you can see the same thing with an IKDC. They start at baseline low at 52, they hit 80 at two years, and they remain the change at 10 years, which is a pretty durable operation, very surprising to us, and very surprising to me. And if you look at the activity level, how active they are, how much cutting and pivoting they do, you can see they drop. They're very high at 16, they're at 12 at baseline, they drop in the first two years, they drop a little bit at six, and they pretty much stay the same between six and 10 years. So in the end, if you look at what matters, if you look at our, your patient-reported outcomes for your IKDC and your CUS, what really makes a difference is any grade three or grade four articular cartilage spot on your knee at baseline, 10 years earlier, it doesn't matter whether it's patellofemoral, medial lateral, or tends to a bad outcome. Any revision, any prior surgery that removed the medial meniscus before the ACL reconstruction, and any subsequent surgery, anytime you have repeat surgery on that knee, from the first ACL reconstruction, they do worse. When you look at activity level, the biggest, the, uh, a lot of these things are, are baseline age, gender, BMI, education. But if you have high grade laxity, and we defined high grade laxity as that knee that was very loose, meaning that knee that had greater than 10 millimeters on a lock, and that knee that had a pivot lock that just drops out of place in the OR, those people have a harder time getting back to high sports and activity. What are not predictors? Which, which it goes against the grain. Medial and lateral meniscus injury and treatment by itself are not predictors. Graft type is not a predictor. Your sport is not a predictor. We actually modeled surgeons. 
It is not a predictor here. If it was a predictor, I probably wouldn't be allowed to show you because the surgeons would be mad. Uh, grade one or grade two MCL or even high grade laxity is not a predictor of patient report outcome. Now, the other thing we looked at was if you look at an individual, it doesn't matter whether the population mean stays the same because half could get worse and half could get better and the mean wouldn't change. So we looked at individual athletes who looked at them between 10 years and two years. So in this graph, basically what you look at, everything above the red line, they got better. Everyone below the red line got worse. So if I look at the individual subscales, 10% on ADLs got worse, 16% on pain, 22% on quality of life, 24% on sports, and 18 on symptoms. And if I look at the IKDC, only 17% get work, worse on an individual basis. That's a pretty durable operation to realize that 80% of people are going to maintain their same patient-reported function from two years to 10 years. And obviously, the marks 50% drop. We've seen that before. So in conclusion, the ACL results remain stable for two to 10 years. That's good for us. It means it's a good operation. Majority maintain their, their patient-reported outcomes, but they decline their activity. The multivariate analysis identified some modifiable risk factors, but not as many as we would like to see. And at 10 years, only a small percentage of patients have pain and symptoms of post-traumatic OA. And believe it or not, even with 1,500, we do not have enough um, sample size to model meniscus injury and articular carcass in the same compartment. And that's being done now as we have 3,500 at 10 years. So it's really frustrating to know that you have 1,600 ACLs. It's taken, you, it's taken you over 10 years, but you still can't model what's really clinically relevant. What happens to the individual that has that meniscus beaten up and a grade three or grade four change in that compartment? We don't know. We'll have that answer soon. And obviously a limitation is we don't have on-site follow-up. We have a group of 425 that come back that, do, that get KT and hop testing but it's not practical to bring a thousand people back. That's not fundable. Now, the next thing I want to go over with is something that we presented last year, uh, about nine months ago to AOSSM. It's published in AJSM, and it's about something that we've been, we've been arguing about, even within the Moon Group, which graph is best for high school and college athlete. So when we published the paper in 2015 AJSM, and we had 2,400 primary ACLs, with greater 92% follow-up, these are the curves we got. The red curve is allograft, the green curve is hamstring, and the black curve is BTB. And what bothered us is that the, the, the green and the black curves were separating uh, under the age of 20. And there's no way that you can control for knee laxity, gender, and sport, and a high school athlete and do a randomized trial. It's not possible. So we wanted to focus on this group right here. And so we wanted to control for confounders, we didn't have enough failures at two years, that's good for the patient. So we had to go out six years because at six years, you double your failure rate. In our, in our cohort, half the failures occur within the first two years and the other half of the failures occur between two and six. And after that, the failures are pretty low because their activity is down. So we're gonna focus on this group, this group of individuals here. So we had 839 primary ACLs reconstructed between 2002 and 2008. And we're comparing autograph BTB versus hamstring. They were prospectively followed six years with 92% follow-up. And we looked at the incidence of failure, both of the graft and on the opposite side. So what we controlled for here, and the reason why it's almost impossible, but not impossible to do a randomized trial, you control for age, gender, ethnicity, BMI, the sport they played, the activity level, knee laxity, and graft choice. So what you find out in the summary of the results is, on the ipsilateral side, what determines failure is high-grade knee laxity, autograph type, hamstring more than BTB, and younger age. If you look at what causes failure on the other side, it's the sported injury. It has, nothing, it has nothing to do with graft or any other factors. So you can have this impossible, uh, you can have a nice little nomogram, great for, great for academics, not practical in the real world, but I think I can show you how we can do it. And then you can actually predict what's going to happen on the opposite side. So the question then becomes, how would you, if, if you have this information, if you want to use it, how do you figure out what the best graft is? No one's going to take pencil and paper in hand with a nomogram and doing it. It's too, it's too uh, old school. Uh, it's, too, it's, it's a pain in the neck, and no one's going to do that. It's not fast enough. So I just want to show you if you did it in pencil and paper, and I'll show you a quick way. So this 14-year-old male football player, believe it or not, if you put a, uh, if you put a graft in him, 
the failure rate is 0.45, it's a hamstring. If you put a BTB, it's 0.27. I don't think I've ever told a 14 year old male football player in my practice that their failure rate is almost one in three at six years. That's an enormous failure rate for, for football. Football is the highest risk. If I look at a 14 year old basketball player, female, the BTB, her risk is 0.05. If I look at her hamstring risk, it's 0.09. I submit to you that that's, that, difference, that difference of four is probably not clinically meaningful. Probably either graft is good for her. But if I look at her other side, if I use a BTB, her risk is 0.3 and her risk is 0.2 of the hamstring. So that 14-year-old female's problem is not the ipsilateral side. It's really the contralateral side. And that's also something you can figure out. So how do you do this? So if anyone can put their camera up to the screen, on, on photo, you don't have to have a QR reader. And if you put that there, your camera up there to take a picture without taking a picture, something will pop up on your screen and that, that what will pop up is a risk calculator. And that allow you in less than patient can do it. You can put the risk calculator up, put in the age, put in the BMI, ask them questions about your activity, activity level, and they'll tell you what the failure rate of a BTB is and the failure rate of an autograph hamstring. It'll also tell you if the failure rate changes if high grade laxity or not. And we actually can look at the opposite of the knee. To me, this has been helpful. I've actually used it in the office. I've actually taken someone who has, was a lacrosse player, uh, 18 years old, and was really worried about getting back to play and worried about failure. So I actually used it to show that and that his failure rate is probably 3% on one side and 3% on the other side. So I actually encourage him that his odds are really good. You could obviously use something like this too. If you know someone's got a high rate of failure, like the female player that's 14, you could show them that the failure rate on the other side is, and the only way to mitigate that is to get them to do some jump training. So in summary, the predictors of ACL graft tear are high grade laxity, hamstring, and younger age. And on the opposite side, it's totally dominated by sport, particularly the sport of, um, of football. And so if you wanna know what the best graft is, uh, it's not always BTB. There are many situations in this age group where a BTB and hamstring are roughly equivalent. You really have to use a calculator. I can't do the math in my head and I can't always say that BTB is better. Sex and BMI are not predictors of, of failure and the risk of contralateral knee is really depends upon the sport they play. And I think it's a good use of our secondary prevention strategies. So in answer to this, Moon is multi-center orthopedic outcome network. Grade three and grade four and female gender are risk factors for worse outcome. Meniscus tears, graft choice, and high-grade laxity are not important for patient-reported outcomes. High-grade knee laxity is that very loose knee you see on physical examination, the knee with greater than 10 on the Lockman, the knee that has a pivot lock, and Bob Magnuson defined that. What graft, what graft is like less likely to fail? Well, I, don't, I do not know of a situation where a hamstring is better than a BTB in, this, in that age group. There are plenty of situations where a hamstring and BTB are, are roughly equivalent. How do you choose the right graph for the patient? If I wanna know what the different failure rate, I have to use my own QR code. And failure on the other side is determined by sport. The question is, is how do we provide this information to you and to the patients in a way that is informative for shared decision-making so that at, this can be the best estimate, and then we can use this as a guide for our patients. So I have to thank all the people who helped fund us in the beginning, and uh, thank the NIH, and it's been a pleasure to uh, be here. It's always a sunny day in Cleveland. It just took a month to get these sunny pictures on, on two different campuses here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirk. That, I, I gotta applaud you on um, a tremendous amount of work that's been put into this and uh, the, the great outcomes that you guys are, are showing. Um, with regard to those grade three, four cartilage defects, did, did the data, was it able to parse out uh, the location of the cartilage defect that mattered? Was, was the medial compartment worse than the lateral or vice versa? It, no, it didn't matter. It, uh, we, it didn't matter. It, it was any grade three or grade four on any surface of the knee. It was mad. Now, having said that, it, the grade three or grade four changes in the medial compartment will show up as a risk factor earlier. It will show up at it'll show up at six years, whereas the other the other things will show up later at ten years. Okay. Now, the problem is is that we did this surgery uh, a long time ago, 2002 to 2008, and we looked at what treatments we did. Either did nothing or chondroplasty. This was not the era of uh, 
this was not the era of things that we would do like uh, like oats or things that we would or microfactors these things were not at least for us were not commonly done way back when i see and then with regard to the uh the the po patient populations that, that had a clear difference between btb and, and hamstring not that um not, not the one where the where it really was equivocal right why, why do you think the hamstring failed more do you think it was uh you know, graft strength, or was it was it the actual fixation, a suspensory fixation versus um, an interference screw? I don't know. Our get our best estimate is that that in in a, in a in a big patient and in a high risk sport like football, um, that it's probably hamstring size that matters, and we have some some retrospective data within Moon, but not hypothesis generating that. Um, we that small hamstrings will fail more, whereas a BTB you can usually always get nine or ten millimeters. Sometimes you get small hamstrings, and three or four hamstring strands is probably not big enough. And I and I suspect that is uh, um, I suspect that is is the reason. Though we we didn't we didn't at that time we did not keep track of hamstring size or the number of strands. We do it now, so maybe in the future at, we can get it. But we that, that's that's my that's our best estimate. So, I, so someone can say, well, what about if I can use a five-stranded or six-stranded hamstring and always get to nine? I think that's a re I think that's certainly very reasonable, and and that that might that might mitigate the problem. True. Well, again, thank you very much, uh, all the presenters. Those are great talks, and um, thank you uh, for watching our What's New in Sports Medicine webinar.